In the United States, only about three to four percent of our saturated fat that we consume as, hum- as 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 Americans actually comes from whole unprocessed meat, steak, chicken, fish. Most of it comes from prepackaged meals. Welcome back to another episode of the Peak Performance Life Podcast. Today, I am very excited to have Sean Baker on the line with us. Sean is a lifelong multi-sport elite level athlete and a medical doctor who served as a combat trauma surgeon and chief of orthopedics while deployed to Afghanistan with the United States Air Force. His focus in recent years has been on using nutrition as a tool for health, performance, and overall well-being. Through his carnivore training system and private consulting work, he has inspired countless thousands of others to challenge a highly flawed nutritional paradigm and to opt for a carnivorous lifestyle instead. I am super excited to get into this topic. Sean, thank you so much for joining us here today. Yeah, Taylor, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. It should be fun. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, let's get a little background of yourself. Uh, obviously, an elite level athlete, and uh, thank you for your service for our country as well. Please tell us a little bit about kind of your background and and kind of the evolution to to getting into carnivore. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, as you mentioned, I'm a I'm a, a medical doctor. I did my training as an orthopedic surgeon, so I'd spent years replacing people's knees and hips and fixing broken bones and doing sports medicine uh, stuff on athletes and. Uh, you know, came through the traditional uh, medical training system uh, until I was, well, I mean, I, my own health, as you mentioned, I've been an athlete. I've set world records and won world championships in you know, three or four different sports and continue to compete even to this day. And, and I'm, you know, getting close to 60 years old at this point. But uh, I discovered, um, you know, in my early 40s that I just didn't feel like I wanted to. I, I just, I could tell my, I was getting, I could tell I was getting old. I mean, quite frankly, I was like, you know, I got, I got everything I see in all my patients. My joints are starting to hurt. Uh, you know, I'm probably developing a little bit of metabolic disease. I was carrying too much body weight at the time. Uh, I'm a big person. I'm, I'm right now I'm 260 pounds. I mean, I was probably 285 back then uh, competing as, and I just won Highland Games World Championships and you need to be big for that sport. But I decided that hey, I I just I need to I need to I need to do something besides just exercise a lot. So I started playing with nutrition. Uh, lost a bunch of weight eating a low fat, high vegetation, lean protein diet, like just like they tell you to do. And I you know, was very disciplined. I exercised. I remember I was working out like three times a day, getting up at four o'clock in the morning to jump rope and work out. You know during my lunch breaks at work and jump rope at night before after I put my kids to bed. Uh, and that wasn't that's clearly that's not sustainable and nor was the diet I was going to, you know, so I, I you know, I, I started to sort of look into research to something I could do long term. And so I went into a sort of a paleolithic diet, which was kind of the the in vogue back, you know, early 2000s, mid 2000s uh, and then transitioned more into a lower carbohydrate approach for a while did a ketogenic diet for a while. And during that time, interestingly enough, we were, uh, as, as an orthopedic surgery community where I was practicing, lots of obese patients and obese patients have more complications. They have higher rates of infections, more likely to get blood clots, more likely to have you know, poor healing, delayed healing, poor uh, range of motion with their, with their joint replacements. So as a community, we collectively decided we're not going to operate on obese patients anymore. Uh, until they have either lost weight or made a valid attempt to lose weight for something like six months. And it was at that point, you know, all the surgeons in the local com- community agreed, so there wouldn't be one guy that would take all the obese patients to, tr- to try to say, hey, we're serious about this. And we were all left to our own devices to try to, you know, make it happen. You know, how do you get your patients to lose weight? Well, you know, there was a bariatric surgeon in town who could do some gastric bypasses, but there was, he could never do as many surgeries as we, as the 50 of us orthopedic surgeons needed to, to do our surgeries. And so my approach was to suggest a, at that time, a ketogenic style diet for patients, because that's what I was doing. And I had some wonderful success with that. And, you know, 20% of the people would actually do it, which is probably realistic. And the interesting thing that I noted was that, uh, and I would always see them back like two weeks later. I say, hey, how's it going with the diet? What's going on with you? And more often than not, what I would start to see is patients that I literally had on the schedule for surgery for a knee replacement would start telling me, you know what, doc, my, my knee doesn't hurt anymore. 
And I was like, well, that's curious because your x-rays still look like garbage, right? But the inflammation was going down so significantly enough to the point where many of them, I, had, I just said, there's no point in doing your surgery if your knee doesn't hurt. I mean, that's that's why we do the surgery, to get you out of pain. If you're not in pain, why, why put you through all the surgery? So that was kind of my aha moment that there's something really here with nutrition and how it impacts, um, you know, our bodies, you know, how we deal with disease and, and, and the cause of disease. And so that led me down a really long rabbit hole. I was continuing to read everything I could around nutrition and how it affected health. And there wasn't, there was some data on that, but not, not, not as much as there is today. And I run into this crazy group of people that are eating all meat. And I thought they were friggin' nuts. I said, you guys are nuts, man. This is, how can you eat an all meat diet? You're going to get cancer. I mean, you're going to get scurvy, all the things we worry about, right? That we still, people ask me about. And, but you know, I, I was open-minded enough to continue to ask questions, to continue to observe, uh, look at some of the source material they were suggesting that was, you know, historically interesting to read. And back in 2016, I said, well, I'm just going to try it for a month. And I did. And I was on social media at the time in a, in a, in a limited capacity, much smaller than I have today. I, I think it was, I was on Twitter. I had a few thousand followers. And I said, hey, guys, I'm going to do this crazy all-meat diet for 30 days. I know I'm going to die, but what am I going to die of? Is it going to be scurvy? Is my heart going to clog up? Is my colon going to fall out from the lack of fiber or whatever? And we had a big joke about it, but I, I mean, I literally did the 30 days and I literally felt really, really good. I was like, wow, this, this is the best I can remember feeling in probably a couple of decades. And, you know, as an orthopedic surgeon, I, I dealt with joint pain, tendon problems, you know, tendonitis, all that, all my life. And I had tendonitis in my right knee and it would affect me. I, you know, there were days I couldn't run. I, it, it was hard to walk days. I certainly didn't want to do squats in the gym and stuff like that. And that had always limited me. And I just kind of, you know, that's part of getting age. I was almost 50 at the time. Uh, I go carnivore and then about two, three months into it, um, it went away. I was like, wow, this is really weird. Cause I've been trying to make it go away, doing everything I know as an orthopedic surgeon and I couldn't get it fixed. So that was another big sort of moment for me. And like I said, I did the 30 days and then I went back to my more balanced the balanced diet that I'm supposed to eat. And I felt immediately worse. I'm like, I, you know, all things being considered, I prefer to feel good. And so I continued doing this six months later, I was breaking all kinds of world records on a, on a concept two rowing machine. I set three or three, I think six American records and three world records on that. My athletic performance went up significantly because I didn't hurt anymore, you know? And so, and I had trained hard my whole life, but there were days that I just didn't feel like training because I was beat up that went away and I was able to train at a really high level and my performance improved because of that. I went on from there to, to convince a bunch of people to try this crazy diet. Uh, mm -hmm. Back in 2017, I had a hundred people do this diet for, for 90 days. And we, we actually tracked everything and we found out that on average, uh, the, the average person lost them like 13 kilograms, so close to 30 pounds, eight centimeters off their waist. So about three inches off their waist, um, their heart rate fell about 10 points. Uh, and then all the subjective stuff that we can measure, you know, sleep, uh, digestive health, mental mood, and, uh, sexual function, um, you know, digestive health, joints and stuff like all got better. You know, I mean, it's pretty much universally, which I, which I thought was really cool. And this is probably a year into me being in the diet. And then uh, a guy named Joe Rogan found out about me doing this and invited me on his podcast. And at the time, I didn't really understand how impactful Rogan was even back in 2017. And so I went on the show and then of course, every vegan on the planet now thinks I'm the worst guy in the world. Cause I tell people that eating meat seems to be helping or at least helped me. And then I kind of just kind of went from there. And so we, we, uh, then I, uh, uh, started to get real serious about replying lifestyle, um, and started going into lifestyle practice full time being that, that being my, my main focus, I stopped operating, um, and we formed a company called Rivero, which, you know, is, is, uh, licensed in all 50 States. We have, uh, many physicians that work for us now that they apply these principles. It's not, not everybody's on a carnivore diet. Some are, if they need it, if it's, you know, in some cases it makes more sense. Some, it doesn't, it's not necessary. So we're, we're, you know, my mission right now is to improve metabolic health through nutrition and lifestyle and, you know, get these people off all these medications. I mean, you know, I mean, the problem we have with healthcare is it costs us, you know, damn near $5 trillion a year now in the United States for, and most of us chronic disease. And we aren't doing anything. I mean, we're not really making progress. There's still just as many sick people. And I think that the mission should be, let's not have so many sick people. Let's stop making sick people and or, or reversing disease, which is not aligned with 
the healthcare system. The healthcare industry is designed and and is is viable because we have this recurring, uh, never ending supply of patients that, that need drugs for the rest of their life. And I think that's unfortunate, and that's not what we should be doing. That's not what I signed up to do as a, as a physician. Uh, I signed up to what I think help people, and I think this is really in line with what I felt as a young naive first year medical student versus the jaded surgeon that I had become after practicing for several decades in this sort of kind of corrupted, you know, conflict of interest system that we now have. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Great story. There's a lot to unpack there. Uh, and by the way, for those who are listening and you heard him say he's 260 pounds, he is 260 pounds and jacked. Um, if you're not, if you're listening via audio and you can't see him right now, uh, he is just absolutely jacked. And we were talking briefly beforehand. He has never used any performance enhancing drugs or TRT or this kind of stuff. He's actually not for it yet. He's still able to crush these world records and do all these amazing things. Um, going back to what you said previously, it is very interesting. I was actually just recently saying this to someone that I wonder how many surgeries could be avoided if people just went on some sort of low inflammatory diet for three months versus going and getting the surgery. And it's, you know, keto is it right? Because we look at what causes the inflammation. It's usually, and I'd love to hear maybe more from you as well about what cause, what foods tend to cause inflammation. But we, you know, you think of sugars, you think of carbs, right? And so both the keto and the carnivore diet would be very low, you know, pretty much no sugar and, you know, pretty much no carbs. And therefore, they both tend to seem to be able to reverse potentially, potentially reverse diabetes, lower inflammation in the body, all sorts of other benefits. Uh, would you would you agree with that? And are there any other foods you would throw in there? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think the the we have so many. Um, you know, if we if you and I were to go in a grocery store 100 years ago, 99% of the stuff on the shelves today just did not exist and wouldn't be there and couldn't be there because we now have, uh, you know, obviously the refrigeration was a, was a huge step in the evolution of how we store and, and, and can transport food. The fact that we have ingredients in our U.S. food supply that are literally outright banned in most of the world is a little bit concerning. And you think about all these preservatives and artificial colors and flavors and thickening agents and emulsifiers and God knows what else is in there. Uh, you know, uh, those things I think do have an impact. I mean, they're, they're, they're considered GR, you know, grass generally recognized as safe because they don't immediately kill the animals or, or, or cause immediate genotoxicity, but what do they do in the long term to our gut health? And, and that's a really important point is I think, you know, if you think about our body and you think about what is, what do we interface the world with? And also most of us think about our skin, as kind of what we touch the world with, but really the surface area of our skin is only a tiny fraction of what our gut surface area is. And remember from our mouth, you know, to the exit part in our anus, that entire tube is external to the, to our body. It is outside of our body, even though it's, you know, inside of our mouth, it's actually considered external. And that surface area is somewhat can, about the size of a football field. So we have this tremendous interface surface with the world through our gut. And that gut is designed to bring things in, whereas our skin is designed to keep stuff out. The gut is designed to bring things in. It has to be permeable. We would starve to death. You know, how do we get food in there? And so when that permeability is altered through some sort of environmental insult, toxin, medication, the wrong foods, then we start absorbing more than we're supposed to. And that has a downstream cascade of inflammatory issues, autoimmune issues. There's some good evidence. There's a guy named Alessio Fizzano who's a physician out of Boston's Children's Hospital that has talked about the relationship between this so-called leaky gut or hyperpermeal gut and autoimmunity. And it's very clear that that's going on. And that's one of the reasons why I see so many people reversing autoimmune disease by changing their diet. And whether it's a ketogenic diet, a low carb diet, or sometimes it's getting rid of the garbage, you know, getting rid of the ultra processed food that, it's, that has become so ubiquitous within the, the Western diet, and particularly the American diet. Right now, something like 70% of the the food that children in this country eat today is ultra processed. And that's, you know, that's, you know, five or more ingredients with ingredients not normally found in the human, you know, in the, in the kitchen, you know, monosodium glute, glutamate or mono and diglycerides and carrageenan, all these weird things that you're like, what the hell are these things? So, um, yes, I think the diet has a tremendous role on that. The weird thing is, you know, cause people are like, well, what about fruits and vegetables? They're supposed to be healthy for us and everybody should be eating them in abundance. And 
interestingly, um, I'm not the guy that's going to tell you vegetables are trying to kill you or anything like that. There are people within the carnivore community who will say that. It's not me. But I will say that some people actually do better when they remove those from their diet for whatever reason. Maybe their gut is so damaged by the overall environment that they now have a hard time tolerating, you know, fiber. You know, for, you know, we know fiber is considered beneficial. And there's a lot of studies that will show that people that consume more fiber generally have better health outcomes. But the really a question I have in my mind is, well, what's that compared to? What is the fiber replacing? If it's replacing donuts and cookies and ice cream, yeah, of course it's going to have a better better impact. If it's replacing something like, you know, <laughs> salmon or or Mike, you know, and I believe a, a steak, then I think it's maybe maybe it's not so much better. Uh, so it is for some people. Some people have problems with obviously gluten, but there are people that have problems with nightshade nightshade vegetables. They have problems with oxalates and lectins and all these things that some people sneer at and laugh at, and say it's ridiculous, and you know people have been eating this stuff for thousands of years. That's true, but at the same time. I can't deny what I see on a daily basis. I'll have somebody that's eating a low carb uh, uh, diet, which is basically beef, eggs, seafood, and some fruits and vegetables. And they eliminate the fruits and vegetables and sometimes the eggs and, and they get better. And they're like, well, something's going on, you know? So, I mean, there's a, there's a, interestingly, uh, now they are now starting to see a lot more data on, you know, ketogenic diets were usually associated with epilepsy and a little bit with diabetes because it's low carb. Now we're starting to see a number of studies coming out showing the efficacy for things like uh, depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia. Uh, there is a study, a case report that's going to come out, a case series uh, that my friend Nick Norwich from Harvard and some of the others and I, we, we put together that's going to be coming out on Crohn's disease and also colitis. We're using carn carnivore diets to, to, to put those diseases completely in remission. You know, these are people with biopsy proven disease on all kinds of you know, biologic, biologic drugs, and they go on a carnivore diet, and they completely go in remission. They come off the drugs, and now their their histological evidence of Crohn's disease is, is gone. So something's going on here for sure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I would love to know – well, first, I want to hear uh, – tell me a little bit about some of the, the sports uh, that you played as an athlete and some of the records mm -hmm. that you've broken. I'd love to hear about that. And then, uh, and then I'd like to get into – um, what, what do you actually eat in a day? Like what does a normal eating day, uh, look like for you? Sure. <laughs> that, that, that won't take long, but the first part from a sports standpoint, you know, uh, I grew up playing basketball as a kid in high school and you know, it was okay. Never, never super addict. I, I kind of bloomed athletically later in life, probably after college, quite honestly. So I started playing rugby as a medical student, believe it or not. I had somehow found the time to do that. And this was in Texas and I was just, for whatever reason, naturally gifted. I was pretty good. I could jump high. I was tall. I was fast. I was strong. And I ended up working my way up, got selected to the all Texas team, the all Western U S team. And then I was recruited to play professionally in New Zealand in medical school. And I actually dropped out of medical school to play rugby. Believe it or not, kind of, my parents were like, what the hell's wrong with you, man? Nice. But I did it. And, you know, did that for, and then I came, then I joined the U S military and, and worked as a nuclear weapons launch officer. So I used to launch nuclear bombs for a living. Um, of course, we never really did, but I mean, we pretended to do that. It was my job. And I played for the for the military team, the all armed forces team uh, until I was about 30. And then I remember I was um, playing this team from Russia and I was laying at the bottom of a pile. Some guy was kicking me in the head and I had blood coming out of my ears. And I was like, I'm done. I'm tired of this stuff. I'm 30. I'm, you know, and so I went back to medical school and the military was kind enough to pay for it. I uh, did my time, uh, you know, got deployed overseas to Afghanistan to do a bunch of, you know, kind of just awful trauma surgery, which was kind of crazy times. But I got into, I did powerlifting for a number of years. I did that for uh, off and on for about 20 years. I was able to set uh, several national American and world records in, in specifically deadlifting. Uh, and again, I did all this stuff drug free. I've never taken steroids, never taken testosterone. I've always been very proud of that fact and very adamant about it. Um, so I ended up pulling uh, 772 pounds or 350 kilos at my top. This was while I was in medical school. Um, and I was, I think at the time I was about 30, I don't know, 33, I think, something like that. And then I got, then I did my surgical residency and that was like, I did, you know, you never got sleep. So I had, a, I couldn't really continue to compete in that. So I still trained, but I couldn't like compete at the high level while I was doing my residency. Uh, after that, I got into um, something called, uh, I did strongman for a while. So, you know, the world's strongest man stuff. So I was doing, you know, the pulling trucks and lifting the Atlas stones and did that. And I took like fifth at the U S championship, uh, my, the, one, the year I competed at the national level 
as a, I think it was just in a 300 pound class. And I, and I realized that if I was going to be successful in this sport, I probably had to take drugs and I just, I'm not, I don't want to do that. So I just said, that's fine. I'll go do something else. So then I got uh, involved in the Highland games, which is a Scottish games. You put on a kilt and you just throw stuff. You throw cabers, which look like telephone poles. You shot, put rocks, you throw these hammers and spin around with one arm and throw 56 pound weights. And I did that for about five years and I ended up winning a ma- I was at the time I was over 40. So I won the master's world championship, set a world record in one of the events uh, and did that for, I don't know, for four or five years. And then, you know, I was, I think it was in my early to mid forties, weighing about 290 pounds, big old guy, you know, and decided that I don't want to be this big anymore. So I, this is where I had that sort of change in nutrition to lose weight and at that time, I discovered rowing. So rowing on a Concept Two machine, uh, which is what you know. They're, they're, believe it or not, they compete on that worldwide. And there's these like there's like hundreds of thousands of people every year that use these things. CrossFit uses them. The Olympic rowing teams always use them to compete on. And so I and and it favors someone who's tall. And if you're strong, is helpful. And so I got into that. And I, I hopped on there one time. And I did a 500 meter row, and I remember it was like a minute 30 or something like that. I said, well, I don't know. I, don't, I looked up the rest. I started looking at the world records just because I'm real competitive. And I said, well, you know, I'm not that far off the world record. Let me train for this stuff. So I hooked up with one of the Olympic gold medalists that happened to be living for living near me. I was in California at the time and trained a little bit. And then I started, you know, getting good at it. And so I started competing in that. And it was something I could do easily because I didn't need a team. I could do it in my garage. Uh, and so I ended up setting got six, six records, six American records, three world records. And, and I still mess around and do that today. In fact, I just set a world record uh, a couple of weeks ago on a hundred meter sprint. So it's a little real fast thing I can do real quickly. And so, so yeah, that's kind of some of the athletic stuff I've been doing. That's over the years. incredible, man. That is absolutely incredible. And uh, how old are you right now? I'm 57 years old. Wow. Wow. You, I mean, you look amazing. It sounds like you feel amazing. You're still out there getting after it at 57 years old. I mean, that's, uh, I think a lot of people look up to that and would want to be like you. When they're yeah. I mean, I've got some goals for 60. I, I've got some pretty, pretty ambitious goals, but I, I think, I think it's possible. You know, I like to be able to dunk a basketball. Um, these are all things I've done in my life. I dunk a basketball, deadlift at least 600 pounds. Um, uh, I'd like to run a sub 60 second, 400 meter, run a sub six, six, six minute mile, and then run a sub 13 second, 100, which that'll probably be the hardest one, I think, but we'll see, we'll see what happens. So I'm, I'm, like I said, I got, I got some stuff, I've got two years to train for it. So I'm, I'm starting that path right now. So I'm having fun with Amazing. this. Amazing. Absolutely love it. Absolutely love it. So yeah, let's transition. I'm sure everyone would love to hear what is it that you actually eat in a day and, and like how many grams of protein are you shooting for? And yeah, what is it that you're consuming? Yeah. So, I mean, in general, and, and right now I'm in this phase where I'm kind of coming down. I was 270. I'm not 260. I'm going to try to get down to about 250, 245. That'll support those running goals. It's hard to run a six minute mile when you weigh 270. I mean, so, and, and it's harder to dunk a basketball at, at that weight. So I'm going to come down a little bit. Uh, today I had two New York strip steaks for, for my breakfast or my, it was kind of, I ate at noon. So it was kind of my lunch and I will probably consume maybe another one pound of hamburger or something like that for dinner. And that's, that's it. That's it for my day. Crazy. Um, over the years, and I've been doing this for eight years, I've typically eaten twice a day. I mean, some days I'll eat once a day, some days I'll eat three times a day, but on average a day for me is, has been about two pounds of meat for breakfast and a pound or two for dinner. And, and that's it. Sometimes I'll add some eggs to that. Sometimes I'll have some seafood. Sometimes I'll have a little bit of dairy products. Um, and, and honestly, that's pretty much it every once in a while. And when I say once in a while, I'm talking two or three times a year, I might have something that's not considered, quote, carnivore, a piece of cake, a piece of fruit or something like that. I just it, the weird thing is, and people will say that sounds horrible. That sounds so restrictive and boring. And it does. It does sound restrictive and boring. But honestly, the weird thing that happens after you do this diet for about two or three months, you all of a sudden you're like, I really don't want that other stuff. I, I, you know, like, like my, I feed my dogs meat and they are so excited to have their, they're, they're literally drooling and they're excited and they're dancing and jumping up and down. It's time to eat. Uh, it reminds me, I got to feed my dogs after this podcast, <laughs> but, um, that's how I am now. I mean, I'm cooking a steak and I'm literally like salivating. Wow, man, this is going to be so good. I enjoy every second of the food I eat. You know, you think about it throughout history, uh, going back, you know, thousands of years, the only people that were eating steaks for dinner were 
freaking royalty, right? I mean, everybody, all the all the all the peasants and serfs were, you know, they're lucky if they got some dirty potatoes and uh, you know some, maybe they got a piece of liver or something like that thrown to them every once in a while. But for the most part, this was considered food of the elite, the royalty. Stay off the king's hunting grounds. You know what I mean? So I get to eat like that every day now, and and you know, it is something that you know ever since we've had civilization, you know, going back whatever it is, 10,000 years, whatever we want to say, civilization started prior to, prior to that hunter gathering type thing. Ever since civilization, we've never had a situation where you could just, you know, get all your food from hunting. I mean, there, there's isolated pockets have done that over time, but for the vast majority of this is, this is a novel um, situation because now we have such a huge, I mean, part of the food supply problem is, we've done such a good job of producing calories and we can feed the world now. We've got more calories than we need, you know, quite honestly. There's the only reason people starve these days is, is not due to food availability, it's food distribution that's a problem. And so now we have this the opposite problem, everybody's getting too damn fat. Uh, but as far as like having access to high quality meat, uh, we've never had a situation where we could just go to the grocery store and buy, I don't know, 50 pounds of meat if you want. I, I can and do all the time. So that's, uh, yeah, but for me, it's pretty straightforward. I enjoy it. It, it keeps me, it keeps me, uh, I feel very happy about this. Uh, it, you know, the interesting thing is when you do consume carbohydrates or sugar or whatever, it becomes pervasive. You think about it more and it doesn't seem to, uh, we know physiologically that carbohydrates are less likely to provoke satiety than some of the other uh, macronutrients do. You know, we know carbohydrates generally, we don't see as much cholecystokinin response, which has a satiety role. And so there's things that, you know, you just get less satiated with carbohydrates. And it's a great way to put on weight if you're trying to gain weight and bulk up because you can eat more. It just, it just helps you to stimulate your appetite for those people that are underweight or trying to put on muscle. That's one of the reasons carbohydrates are so often used by bodybuilders is because it just helps them to consume enough calories or more calories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I know someone as well right now who's trying to gain weight and the nutritionist is like, eat more carbs. And they're like, wait, shouldn't I be doing more protein? They're like, yeah, protein's great, but it's going to satiate you more. And mm -hmm. if you want to really gain weight, you got to you got to eat a lot more carbs. So yeah, I totally agree with you there. What is it that uh, and I and I by the way, I'm the same way once I went kind of paleo, I'm, I'm paleo, I would consider for many years. And uh, because I had an inflammation problem, I had massive inflammation in my fingers, hands, wrists and arms and, and eventually went to tons of different doctors, chiropractors told me all different diagnoses. Oh, you have a herniated disc, you have carpal tunnel, you have arthritis, you have. And then in the end of the day, once I lowered the inflammation in my body, uh, mm -hmm. it all went away. And now I'm obviously in, in better health and mentally and physically than I've ever been. Uh, and, and exactly what you said, I don't crave these other foods. Right. I don't crave. I, I don't when I go to a, my kid's birthday uh, party and p everyone's eating cake. I'm not I'm not hungry for the cake. I literally look at that piece of cake and I'm thinking, oh, I'm just going to be if I ate that, I would feel so horrible. So, yeah, I totally agree with you. People need to understand that just because you've been stuck in a certain pattern for many years doesn't mean that you can't easily change that and crave different things going forward. But what is it? People might be wondering, OK, so what what is it about? just eating meat all the time. And it sounds like for me, eggs are a superfood. I eat, I eat five eggs regularly and feel great on eggs. Uh, I know some people might have some sensitivities to eggs. What is it about the carnivore diet that has benefited so many people? What is, what is the difference between, you know, what is it that when people are eating vegetables and fruit, cause people might say, well, you know, vegetables and fruits and these other things, when you're just eating meat, what's, what's the good thing about that? Yeah. Okay. So it's very clear. I mean, you're either on the diet or not. So the, 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 the delineation between diet, not diet, what's not, what's approved and what's not is very simple. It's very straightforward. You know, you don't typically have to count or track or things like that for most people because it intuitively provides uh, satiety signals that are kind of more physiologically appropriate for most people. There are exceptions to this. The other thing is there are no it is very difficult to make ultra processed food out of carnivore products. I mean, it just doesn't exist with keto, paleo, vegan. There's all this garbage that gets in there and the food industry knows it and they stamp a keto label on it or a vegan label on it. And you think it's good. And it's really just garbage. You know, a cookie's a cookie. I don't care if it's vegan or keto or whatever it is. So there's right. none of that. So you've clearly eliminated all the potential truly bad things from your diet. The other thing is, Sometimes the monotony is a it, it, it the monotony of it 
can make you le- just want to eat less. I mean, there's just that, okay, I'm, I'm not, I'm not trying novel food, so I don't feel like I need to overeat. So I'm, I'm eating what I need for my nutrition, my nutritional purposes. And that's it. It is inherently viscerally satisfying. I feel really good after I ate a steak. I'm happy. I'm like, wow, I, I feel like I really was, I was really nourished. Um, I think the other thing is, um, there are a lot of people that suffer with food addiction. I mean, that is a real legitimate thing. And, and the, the, the prevalence of that is approximately 14%, which mimics that of alcoholism. So we see equal, you know, as many people that are alcoholics are, are often food addicts. And so for alcoholism, no one would ever say, hey, just have a couple of drinks on a weekend. And that's not how you stop becoming an alcoholic. I mean, it's usually abstinence. And so for some people, they need that level of restriction. Additionally, um, right now, it's estimated somewhere between 3 and 20% of the population is suffering from IBS or irritable bowel syndrome. It's probably closer to that higher end. And for those people, um, surprisingly, meat is so easily, uh, is so gentle on the stomach for most people. You know, there's some people that, that maybe have low some stomach acid due to chronic disease where it may be more difficult. But for the most part, when I'm, I can sit down and eat a two pound steak. And 15 minutes later, I don't even know I've eaten anything. I mean, I'm, I'm not hungry, but I don't feel that gas and bloating. And, you know, whereas you eat, you know, you pound down a salad and all of a sudden your stomach starts talking to you and you get a little bloated, a little bit of discomfort. And we, we consider that normal, right? It's like, well, that's normal. It's just a little bloating. But we would never expect that from any other organ in our body. There's no other system where it's like, oh, I just got a little chest pain. No big deal, right? It's, oh, that's normal. Or when I breathe, it hurts. Or when I walk, my knees hurt. We would never accept those things at normal, but we, because we've been so conditioned to think that it's normal to be bloated and farting and belching and have, just have that little discomfort. And a lot of women, you know, a lot of these yoga women, they've got these little three month pregnancy bellies right after they have food, they call them food babies, right? They assume that's normal and it's not, it's, it's a sign of one of two things, either the food is wrong or your gut's broken. One of the two things has to be true for that to be going on. And with carnivore, one of the most common things I see probably within days is people say, hey, I don't have bloating and I don't have, I don't have digestive pain like I used to have. And I think that's an early uh, sort of sign that, you know, yeah, there's some some good things going on. Because I think I do think a lot of the diseases which we had alluded to start in the gut. And, you know, again, what what is the most common thing that goes in our gut is food, right? I and mean, food and whatever we drink. And so, uh, sure, that's, that's, that's some of the reasons why that is. And the nutrition is so much more bioavailable. You know, we talk about... Because a lot of people say, what about all these phytonutrients, you know, the, the tannins and the polyphenols and all the things you're missing out on? Well, guess what? Beef has something like 70,000 nutrients in it, believe it or not. It's not just amino acids and a little bit of fat and a few vi- vitamins and minerals. There's 70,000 unique nutritional compounds, not to mention like the carnosines and the carnitin and the creatine and the answering. There are polyphenols that cows have, and they absorb them, and they go into their meat, and we consume them, and they're very bioavailable for us. A cow's diet is far more varied than my diet when it comes to plant food. There, I can only eat a small fraction of the plants that are around me. If I go out in my backyard and start munching randomly eating leaves, you know, I'm going to get sick. I'm going to, you know, maybe die. Who knows? Whereas a cow has a the ability to, to process way more food, and they they obtain a lot more phytonutrition nutrition than we could we could ever do. And because of that, it is it is actually incorporated into their tissues. Uh, Stefan Van Vliet out of Duke University and Fred Provenza had a very nice paper on this showing the benefits of particularly uh, pastured meat and how diverse it is in some of these plant compounds. So you're still getting these foods, even though they're not coming from the plants themselves, but you're getting them in probably a more bioavailable uh, capacity. So meat is a complete food. I'm convinced of it. And I, you know, if it wasn't, I'd be, I'd long ago been dead because that's pretty much all I eat. Yeah. I mean, I've heard the same from, from many people too, as well. And, and they seem to be really, really in shape people, people who just eat meat all the time. So there's certainly something to it. Now I'm sure you get a lot of objections. You get a lot of people, I'm sure fiber is a one is a big one, right? Well, what about the fiber or what about this or what about that? Um, how do you answer that question of, uh, you know, does your body need the fiber and you're not getting any, or what are maybe one or two other really big objections that everyone always throws at the carnivore diet? Yeah, well, I mean, the fiber thing is clearly fiber is not essential. If it were essential, I would have long ago perished, right? Now, people say, well, it's conditionally beneficial. And I, I do think conditionally it is beneficial. If you are eating a standard Western diet, rich in highly processed, low fiber foods, you're going to get sick. And if you 
displace some of that with fruits and vegetables or whole grains or whatever fiber source you prefer, yes, it's going to have a net positive effect. But to say that it is an essential uh, part of the diet is, I think, not based on any kind of real evidence. I mean, the, the recommendations are we, we should get roughly 25 grams of fiber. Uh, I, you know, and again, most of the, it's, it's kind of interesting when you look at nutrition research in general, it is, you know, most people understand that it is a very challenging science to do, particularly when it comes to human nutritional research, because we can't lock humans in cages and see what they're eating and then cut them open when they're done kill them and cut them open and see like we can with animals. So it's really hard to do good nutrition research. And the research that we do have is mostly these observational things. It's like, well, do we, do we really know what these people are eating? No, we don't. We're just telling them to try to remember their best to their best of the ability. And there's all kinds of recall bias and people overestimate how much fruit they ate and underestimate how much meat they eat. And they intentionally say, well, I, you know, when you ask your kid, how many cookies did they eat? And they'll say, well, I only had two. And meanwhile, 20 of them are gone. So we know that there's there's all kinds of problems with the data that's coming out there. And I think with regard to, I mean, you know, there's a study recently came out looking at rheumatoid arthritis. Higher fiber diet makes it worse. Um, there's uh, through some interaction with one of these bacterial species called Prevotella. So there are studies out there now that are starting to question, you know, the, the, the true sort of, I guess, benefit of fiber. And I think I think it can be beneficial and it depends. And again, I think it depends. And I think a lot of the answers that we have here are going to be, it's conditional. It depends what else is going on. Uh, so the fiber thing, I think, is is, is the same way. Uh, I, I routinely see people that remove fiber from their diet and their health unequivocally gets better. You know, And, and again, I'm talking in the short term. They, they no longer have this disease. They no longer have Crohn's disease because they've, they've cut out fiber. Now, some people will say, well, what about the long term? You know, and this is another objection because they'll say, well, you know, what about you increased your risk for heart disease because you're eating all that saturated fat? And I would say that I honestly don't know. And I, I've been, somebody's criticized for me for saying, I don't know. I'm like, well, how do, how would I know? No one knows. No one's on, no one has done these studies. No one will ever do these studies. And, and in fact, if you look at any diet that ever has been proposed, I don't care if it's a Mediterranean diet or vegan diet, no one has done a control, randomized controlled trial of adequate length with adequate number of people for adequate length of time to really make definitive conclusions. All we're doing is we're looking at populations and saying, well, we think this group kind of eats this way. And, you know, maybe that's a diet, maybe it's not. There's so many other confounders. So to truly do the studies that would definitively answer this are cost prohibitive, probably unethical. And I don't think anyone ever would sign. I mean, would you sign up to sit in a metabolic ward for your whole life? And have everything variable measured and only difference be a food. And ideally it would be with twins. I mean, so we can't do that. And the people that do nutrition will say, well, it's the best we have and we're going to make inferences. And I, I liken that to like, if I were to board a plane tomorrow and I'm, and I'm walking on the plane and the, you know, on, on the, uh, on, on, when I look in the cockpit, the, the pilot seems a little drunk and I walk by the first window and I, I notice one of the engines is kind of wobbly and, there's a crack in the fuselage and I'm like, Hey, wait a minute. And they said, well, I know this is, this, uh, this is, you know, the best we can do airlines. Just, I would say, no, I'm not going to do that. So I think the problem is, you know, when people say it's as best, we, it's as good as we have, except the results, I question that. And the reason I say that is because, well, if, if I were to listen to what they said, then, and, and if it were true by me eating, three pounds of red meat every single day for eight years, I should be the sickest person on the planet. I should be full of cancer, dead from a heart attack, you know, diabetes, you know, every fat is a house. I mean, but instead, none of that has happened to me, right? So no, it's the opposite. So it's, You're probably it, one of the healthiest 57-year-olds, if not the healthiest. Well, I mean, and you know, I mean, obviously I work out, I take care of myself, yeah. I sleep well, I do all those other things as well. So there's confounders sure. even there, but still, I mean, so... You know, there's a lot of gaslighting that goes on these days about people. I mean, politics doesn't matter. You know, there's all kinds of people. You know, they're trying to convince you that the the sun is actually pink or something like that. And you know, there, there's a study that shows the sun is pink. Uh, looks yellow to me, but you know. And I think the one nice thing about health is you can independently verify if you feel better. You can independently verify if you look better. You can independently verify if you feel better. And so I tell people, don't listen to me test it out yourself. And if it works, it works great. If it doesn't go do something else. And the nice thing from my perspective is a lot of people have tested it out. And a lot of people have said, you're right. I feel a hell of a lot better. I'm good for you. Keep doing it. You know, and that's, that's kind of where I kind of 
you know, that, that, I limit my, <laughs> my, uh, proclamations or my ability to say I know things based upon what I can see from today to tomorrow. Like I said, as physicians, uh, I mean, our, I think our job should be to take six people and make them healthy. I mean, I think that's reasonable, but instead we get into this, oh, we're going to prevent, we're going to make you live to a hundred or we're going to protect you from heart disease by taking this drug. And, and really we're just kind of like, man, I don't know, maybe it's going to help. Maybe it's not. And we kind of forget the, because people come to the, to the doctor's office feeling like garbage They'll do a bunch of labs saying, yeah, your labs look great. I don't know, go, go get some sleep or something. I mean, there's not much help there. Whereas, you know, it should be, hey, I don't, I think, I think, I don't care how old you are. I think you should feel good. I, I don't think you should wake up every day in pain and suffering and tired and sad. I don't think that's a normal existence, but, or, or, or should be, but it is. It's so common that, you know, I remember people telling me when I was 30, you know, when I was in my 20s, where do you get to be 30? Where do you're 40? Where do you're 50, you know? And I'm just, I'm, well, when's it going to happen? I still feel pretty good. So obviously um, I think we've been, mis we've been kind of brainwashed into accepting disease as normality, which is, I think is a real problem. And, and the problem with that, I mean, I mean, the good news about that is there's companies that got a pill for that and they make a lot of money on that. So that's, it, it, it's, it behooves them to continue that uh, sort of paradigm that, yeah, it's just normal to get sick as you get older. And here's your pills, you know, embrace the suck, so to speak. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, there's some some really really good points there. I mean, when people say, "Oh, meat is bad," didn't you uh, read the China study book or whatever whatever other you know book or study that, that that's out there? And it's like, well, hold on a second. Like, what kind of meat are we talking about? Are we talking about a grass fed steak that wasn't cooked with any oils, or are we talking about you know a fast food burger that's you know cooked in seed oils with a bun, with a soda, and with French fries, right? Mm -hmm. And there's no there's no study that shows a distinction of people who you know, when they say meat, is it, is it, has there been a study on people who have eaten grass fed meat and have not eaten any processed foods and, and no added sugars and anything like that? Where's, where's that study, right? It doesn't, it doesn't exist. So I think, yeah, what you're saying makes, a, makes a lot of sense. I really like it. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, it's interesting because in 2015, you may remember the world health organization proclaimed, uh, red meat, unprocessed red meat is a class two carcinogen. And ever, ever since then, a uh, secondary, you know, in, in reference to, colorectal cancer and number of studies have come out since and saying there that really doesn't hold up but we still could have cling to that who proclamation because they are considered this wonderful health authority that we should all listen to um Same you, know, I, you know i mean right? i don't want to be too conspiratorial but you know the largest private funder of the world health organization is a guy named bill gates who oh by the way is heavily invested in fake meat and you know maybe there's some conflict of interest there but you know, it's interesting because like when we talk like, like for instance, Asia, there was a paper in 2018 that, that, that was put out of South Korea talking about the Asian perspective on red meat and colorectal cancer. And what they discovered that is in Asia where they don't eat their red meat with bun, French fry, Coca-Cola, they eat it with maybe some vegetables like in a stir fry, no relationship to colorectal cancer and all these, you know, meat can some whether it's processed, unprocessed, it doesn't seem to matter. So my thought is, you know, if we look at like the like, for instance, saturated fat is always talked about. Well, in the United States, only about three to four percent of our saturated fat that we consume as as as, as Americans actually comes from whole unprocessed meat, steak, chicken, fish. Most of it comes from prepackaged meals, desserts. You know, because you think about dessert, cake has eggs, butter. That's where your saturated fat is coming from for most people. So when when you're saying cut back on saturated fat, maybe they're saying cut back on all the garbage food uh, because it's it's such a confounded issue, you know. And and so uh, there was a there was a recent uh, Mendelian randomization study. And a lot of people that are they're sort of pro you know, cholesterol lowering. We'll talk about these these Mendelian randomization studies. Well, there's one just came out showing that Mendelian randomization studies with regard to meat consumption show no relationship between that and heart disease. You know, which we're always hearing, oh, red meat's going to give me a heart attack. So I think there's a lot of reason to be questioning the status quo. Uh, Washington University out of St. Louis in 2022 published a, a really nice article looking at um, red meat consumption. And their conclusion was red meat, and this was a huge study they did, they looked at a huge, huge review study. Red meat does not seem to have any significant risk for all cause mortality, cancer, heart disease. And the studies that suggest that they do are based on very poorly designed studies, what they call shoddy research. 
Uh, and that was our quote. And, and so it's, it, it, that, that's really what the, the truth is. And there's been, since the beginning of nutrition, the American Di- Diabetes, or I'm sorry, the American Dietetics Association was founded back in 1917 by several members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Seventh-day Adventist Church are religious vegetarians. And that has been the bias within nutrition since over 100 years now. And so we've always sort of had that. And they occupy, unfortunately, they, well, I mean, for whatever, for whatever reason, they occupy a disproportionate number of positions within the, the realm of nutrition science. It's heavily influenced by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, which has its own agenda. And that agenda is definitely to you know, kind of make us mostly kind of plant-based vegetarians. And, and that's what we've seen. Yeah. Yeah. And we've had a number of guests on this, on this podcast who have, you know, really debunked the whole myth of like, oh, it's the cholesterol that causes, causes heart disease. It's like, no, it's, it's actually the inflammation. Right. And so again, there's many people who are, who are talking about this right now and showing that the, it's again, is cholesterol high because inflammation is also high and cholesterol is high because they're eating cake and, and that's why? Or is it, again, if you have high cholesterol without the inflammation, you know, where's a study on that, right? And I don't think there there is one. So, Well, there is one. And in fact, it'll be published uh, this summer. Matt Budoff at UCLA is doing this study on the so-called lean mass hyper responders. And so they took uh, 100 people with sky high cholesterol. We're talking LDL cholesterol, three, four, five, 600, like ridiculously high. And all of them had that level at least five years. All of them been on a sort of a ketogenic style of diet. They had, they had a high level, uh, you know, vascular screening via CT angiography. Uh, they took the initial study. They found that these people have very low level of heart disease. They're following them out while they continue in this really high level. They're going to follow up. The initial data from one year is going to come out. I think they've been, they've been funded for an additional couple of years. And so the initial data is going to come out. Um, I, I, it's already been collected. They're probably writing it up right now. Probably this summer we'll have some data on that. My suspicion is, because I know a lot of the people involved in that study, is it's going to show no significant increase in heart disease. And in fact, perhaps even some regression of heart disease, which will be absolutely uh, sort of you know paradigm shifting if that if that doesn't indeed show that. So, so I'll stay tuned for that. Uh, myself, I tell people don't ignore cholesterol. It's, it, it is something to further investigate. If you've got high cholesterol, find out why you have high cholesterol, because that's very important in my view. And then sort of figure out what's the best course of action. If you have high cholesterol and you're metabolically a disaster, diabetic, hypertension, infl- inflamed, yeah, you're a walking time bomb. If you have high cholesterol and you have none of those, maybe you're not. And we, and I, I still say maybe because I don't know for sure, but I think that's just something that we, we're, we're the people that are interested in this are, are, really pushing forward for the science. And it's tough because, you know, the people who want to sell you drugs have billions of dollars to do research. But these, these other guys, they're not making any money off this stuff. So it's harder to get that research done. Yeah. Yeah. Really, really great information there. Can't wait for that study as well. Um, Sean, I want, I'd love to, for you to tell people about what you're doing now with your, with your clinic, with your, you know, helping people reverse autoimmune diseases yeah. and metabolic diseases and things like that. Yeah, one of my frustrations as a physician was, you know, even as I discovered that nutrition has such an impactful way of disease, even as an orthopedic surgeon, you know, the reason I went into orthopedics was I remember as a medical student, I would do my family practice rotation and and all the doctors were bitching and complaining. They're like, oh, man, these patients are never compliant. They never change their diet. They just they don't take their medicine. They never get better. And and they were frustrated. I was like, I don't I don't have any part of that. I'll go be a surgeon. If somebody breaks your leg, I'll throw a metal rod down there and done. I fixed them. Right. And that's true. 10% 10% of the time, but most of orthopedics was somebody coming in as obese and their knee hurts or their shoulder, they've got tendonitis. And that's all literally the orthopedic, orthopedic manifestations of metabolic disease. I mean, that's what I came to discover. So I was like, well, how do we address this? And uh, so we started something called Rivero.com. You know, it's a Rivero Health. Uh, we are a, a healthcare company that's licensed in all 50 states. And our mission is to reverse chronic disease doing what we're talking about, changing diet, fixing lifestyle, fixing sleep, uh, so on and so forth. And we've got, you know, like I said, we just actually, we just launched a few, few months ago and we just started to bring in our patients on. We're already getting people off medicine. So it's like, it's really cool because we're already getting, we're doing what I wanted to do when I first went into medicine. When I was a 16 year old kid studying for the medical college acceptance test, you know, five years before I had to take it, thinking in my mind, how can I help people? This is what I had in mind. And, you know, but you go through the medical system and it's, 
it's not what you it's not what you're led to believe. And so I'm trying to create this, you know, and myself and others. And we've got fortunately we have thousands upon thousands of patients that are waiting for this. We've got you know nearly ten thousand people on our waiting list. We have um, hundreds of physicians and healthcare providers that are like, I want to do this because I know they feel the same thing I do. The medical system is broken, and this is you know one of the ways finally to 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 sort of change the paradigm because we need to. I mean, we cannot alone with it. We cannot afford as a country, as a society, to continue in this dis- disaster of, of epidemic proportion chronic disease. I mean, that is literally destroying society. And so the only way we're going to, we're not going to drug or technology our way out of it. We've got to figure out a way to stop making sick people or, or actually curing disease, actually reversing disease, which I think is eminently doable. And, you know, we don't, we don't hear that from the, the pharmaceutical companies. They are more interested in the recurring subscription model of forever drugs and be on it for the rest of your life, which I think is a problem. I agree. I agree 100 percent. And I really appreciate you and the work that you're doing. Uh, so Rivero.com, R-E-V-E-R-O.com is Correct. where people can can check that out. And I highly recommend people, especially if you had you've been diagnosed with some autoimmune or some other thing, or you're pre-diabetic or diabetic, and you've been told that you're just going to have to take this medication the rest of your life. Highly, highly recommend you give this a shot. Try something else. You know, Sean's seeing the results, not only in himself, but in lots of patients and uh, really just appreciate everything that you're doing uh, in the world here today, Sean. So um, thank you so much for joining us. Where else can people find you, follow you, learn more from you? Yeah, yeah, Delore, thank you very much. Yeah, so Rivera.com obviously is a company if you're looking for a doctor to, to help you with that. But I mean, for my purposes, I am on social media. I am on Instagram at uh, Sean, S H A W N Baker, 1967. So that's the year I was born, Sean Baker, 1967. I am on YouTube at Sean Baker, MD. I am on uh, Twitter, I guess it's now called X, on at capital S, capital B. So it's S Baker. MD and the MDs capitalize it too. So it's capital S, capital B, A K E R, and then MD. Uh, I am I am embarrassed to admit that I also have a TikTok, <laughs> Sean Baker MD. So anyway, that's where you can find me. Amazing, amazing. Thank you so much, man. You're you're obviously you know you're walking the walk uh, and and you're really living it, and uh, the results are incredible. And I really love your mission. So thank you so much, and uh, hopefully we could do this again one day. Yeah, I'd love to. Thanks, Delore. Appreciate it, man. You have a wonderful, wonderful day, and thanks for doing this. Thank you. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the episode, can you please leave us a rating or review and subscribe? I've realized that while we have actually increased our downloads a lot, we're actually getting a lot of downloads, which I'm really happy about. We actually have very few ratings. So, and I realized that I've never asked people really to rate much. So I'm asking you now, if you could please rate and review and subscribe. And if you enjoyed the episode, please forward it along to anyone that you think will get value out of this. Also, if you haven't checked out our line of products at buypeakperformance.com, you get 20% off your first order. That's www.buybypeakperformance.com. We have some incredible products, including our organic high altitude coffee. If you don't know this, coffee is one of the most heavily sprayed with pesticides out of any crop. So it's really important that you drink organic coffee. We've gone above and beyond to source what we believe is the highest quality and healthiest organic coffee in the world. We're also famous for our organic green superfood powder. You can get 20% off of that as well at buypeakperformance.com. We also have an organic vegan and paleo plant plant protein. See, most of the vegan proteins out there are using brown rice protein, which is really not a good source of protein. And it's also a grain. And if you're paleo, you know that grains tend to cause inflammation in some cases for some people. And so we wanted to make one that was paleo friendly and vegan and organic. We made an amazing amino acid profile. So it's really one of the best plant proteins for muscle building. So you can check out Peak Performance Organic Plant Protein. You can find that on our website. Of course, all our products are on Amazon as well. So thanks again. And again, please, if you enjoyed the episode, please forward it along to someone who you feel can get value out of it. And please leave us a rating, review, and subscribe. Thank you.